Dirty Harry was a third person action game which was being based around the classic film license of the same name. After being talked up for some time by its publisher Warner Brothers Interactive Entertainment, the game faded from the spotlight, never to be seen again. Years later, I worked to uncover the tale behind its demise and to understand more about this infamous licensed project gone awry. The first traces of the Dirty Harry video game date back to 2004. Warner Brothers had been seeking to propel Dirty Harry back into relevance with a strategy set to culminate in 2007. This would have kicked off with a Dirty Harry HD DVD film collection releasing that year. Whereas that product was targeting older, more seasoned fans of the series, WB would commission a video game to attract younger audiences. Around June 2004, they began inviting people to pitch for the rights and share their ideas for how to use the property in the realm of gaming. Among the participants was Argonaut Games, the developer who was once responsible for the infamous unreleased title Star Fox 2, as well as the Croc series. A couple of other studios presented proposals, but it was The Collective Inc. who ultimately locked down the contract. They were hired to produce a Dirty Harry video game for Xbox 360 and PS3. Shortly thereafter, Warner Brothers also partnered with Sensory Sweep, a studio in Salt Lake City, Utah. Both developers were veterans in the field of licensed games. While Sensory Sweep's involvement was never officially announced, their role in the Dirty Harry video game is integral to the story behind it. They essentially worked on a second version of the game for other systems. It was decided very early on that they would make their own game from scratch rather than port the collectives over. It followed the same plot, had similar gameplay, but was an alternative approach being made primarily for less powerful systems with the exception of the PC. Sensory Sweep was set to release it on PS2, the original Xbox, PC, Nintendo Nintendo DS and Wii. There were plans for a PSP release too, although it only ever existed in the form of early design documents. Combined with the version by The Collective, that makes a total of nine different platforms that it was initially meant to launch on within the same year. It was a big multi-million dollar venture signing on celebrity voice actors and other contributors. 70s movie star Max Julian had been brought on to write dialogue for it, and Clint Eastwood was involved from the start. He was set to reprise the titular role of Dirty Harry Callahan and served as a consultant for narrative developments. In 2005, when Warner Brothers Interactive announced Dirty Harry, they propped him up as the face of its marketing. Despite this, Eastwood never once actually paid a visit to the collective or any of the other game studios involved. All of his feedback was brought to the table by representatives of his employed by his company Malpaso Productions. Former workers of the collective said that Malpaso was overseeing much of the production there, checking in fairly regularly. When asked if Eastwood had ever provided any any specific suggestions for the story, they could recall only one instance, when he apparently requested Harry's love interest be an Asian woman. Development at the collective faced challenges from the get-go. Their management was insistent that the company use its own internally developed engine for the project. This was a policy they adopted in 2002, as they had hoped to popularise the engine enough that other developers would pay them to use it. It was first used to make a video game adaptation of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and was dubbed the Slayer Engine in its honour. When Dirty Harry was starting out at the collective, dev kits for both the Xbox 360 and PS3 had yet to be sent out to them. The team, however, had deadlines to meet, and therefore had to begin making the game assets regardless. This might not have been such a problem had they not been expecting the new consoles to produce perfectly lifelike graphics. When the kits eventually arrived, the hardware wasn't nearly as powerful as they had been anticipating. Because of this, they had overdeveloped their earliest assets for the game, they had to tweak and redo them, costing valuable time and money. This was on top of the added expenditures of modifying the Slayer engine to work with the new systems as well. According to one of its lead designers, the early development environment of the PlayStation 3 baffled the collective. As a result, the PS3 version of Dirty Harry was hardly ever started. The Xbox 360 quickly became the lead development platform, and the PS3 game ended up on the back burner. After some setbacks, by 2006, their work was starting to materialise into something resembling a playable experience. The Collective's game was a fairly linear shooter with duck and cover elements and occasional quick time events, as well as hand to hand combat for a less lethal approach when the story demanded it. Harry could also weaponize objects in his environment sometimes, such as in one sequence a brawl in a bar in which he was able to fight using a pool cue. After and before levels, players could enter a police gun range and equip different weapons, offering a break from Harry's trademark 44 Magnum. On the other hand, Sensory Sweep's version, at least initially, 
initially was attempting to feature a bigger variety of gameplay types. There were no fist fights or target practice like in the collective's title, but there were driving sections. In between the standard shooting gameplay, Harry would engage in fixed on-rails car chase segments, a series of over-the-top action set pieces as he makes his way from one mission locale to the next. He could barge them off the road by slamming into them or by firing his weapon out of the window. Jason Ablett was the project's original lead designer at Sensory Sweep and helped to envision a somewhat different take on Dirty Harry from what the collective had in mind. Jason and his team thought it unwise to try to replicate the more photorealistic graphical style of the HD counterpart on less powerful systems. Instead, they explored a number of more stylized abstract looks before settling on cell shading. This was partly because Ablett was a huge fan of the Suda51 game Killer7. It was pitched as looking like something torn from the pages of a graphic novel, which was accepted, albeit with some reluctance. In the original design documents drafted by Jason Ablett, a third style of gameplay is mentioned named Investigation Mode. What exactly this was intended to be remains a mystery, as it was never implemented and not long into the project project Jason left to work elsewhere. His successors were never informed of what it was meant to be, leading to it being cut to save resources. Mr. Ablett was not available for comment as he unfortunately passed away in the years that followed. His former colleagues described him as an enthusiastic presence who had high hopes for the project. A few months into 2006, E3 was fast approaching, but the collective's game was still far from being ready for a public demonstration. As a solution, Warner Brothers hired Acme Filmworks to put together a CGI trailer using some of the collective assets. The trailer portrayed a number of sequences reminiscent of scenes from the original movie, but kept plot details minimal since the script had yet to be finalised and Clint Eastwood had yet to record any lines for the game. The video instead recycled sound bites from the film series for Harry's brief amount of dialogue. The script for the game was being penned by Kelly Wand, whose previous credits included several video game adaptations such as Spider-Man 2. Thanks to documents leaked to me by former developers, extensive plot details are now known. The story was set between the first and second movies Dirty Harry and Magnum Force. It began with Harry investigating a chain of brutal murders caused by an individual calling themselves the Gemini Killer. There's growing unrest among the citizens of San Francisco at the police's inability to apprehend the murderer. A local reverend, Colton Clay, who would have been played by actor Lawrence Fishburne, steps forward to lead the outpouring of criticism against the city's mayor for failing to keep the public safe. Later on, he would have declared his bid for the mayoral candidacy with the intent of taking over from him and leading San Francisco in a new direction. Harry, meanwhile, delves into the dingy criminal underworld looking for answers and learns that the Gemini Killer is nothing more than a pawn under the control of a shadowy figure known as the Scarab. From there, Harry chases down various leads as he investigates the Scarab and their ties to the mob to unmask this master of puppets. Throughout the story, Harry is aided by a robust cast of supporting characters. Leah Chen, portrayed by Lucy Liu, would have been his love interest, a worker at the mayor's office who assists him with his investigation. There were his fellow officers like returning character Lieutenant Al Bressler, whom Gene Hackman had signed on to play, and Harry's new partner, the feisty Maria Espinosa, the role of which had been given to Rosalind Sanchez. Other known actors on the cast included Keith David, Cole Hauser, Michael Bean, Freddie Rodriguez, Joseph Ganascoli, Kristen Chenoweth, and Michael Chiklis. The game featured a slightly morbid running gag throughout it, in which a number of Harry's partners are abruptly killed. It's possible this was done in reference to the second Dirty Harry film, Magnum Force, in which Harry does mention that multiple partners of his have died while in his company. Approaching the third act, Harry interrogates an associate of the mob, who alludes to the possibility of the mayor himself somehow being the scarab. Harry, alongside Maria, returns to City Hall to confront him. When they arrive, however, they find the building under siege from Reapers, the henchmen of the Scarab. The two detectives fight their way inside and find that Leah Chen has vanished. The mayor, meanwhile, has taken his political opponent, Reverend Clay, at gunpoint inside his church. Harry and Maria head over there and eventually discover Mayor Coletti holding a gun to Clay. As they watch on, Clay suddenly pulls out a gun and shoots him in the head before firing at Harry and Maria. Clay escapes, getting into a limo surrounded by a convoy of armed Reapers. They've also taken Leah Chen hostage. It transpires that Clay himself is the Scarab and that he's been perpetrating acts of terrorism around the city, including the Gemini killings, to weaken the mayor's foothold and gain control of the city for his own nefarious gains. A car chase ensues which would have been playable in Sensory Sweep's version of the game and restricted to a cutscene in the collectives. This sequence would have ended with them pursuing Clay's convoy over the Golden Gate Bridge. At one point, Harry's car rolls over, a violent crash which claims 
Maria's life. A vengeful hurry then kills Clay's right-hand man Rivers, but not before he divulges the location of their base of operations, Alcatraz. Harry commandeers a media helicopter and flies over to the island. In the last level, Harry battles through a barrage of Reapers fortifying Clay's stronghold at the old prison. Inside, he reaches a landing platform where he finds Clay holding Leah hostage with an explosive belt around her chest. Harry quickly shoots him, sending him reeling into the helicopter behind him, dropping the detonator. The two face off as Clay rains bullets down on him from the chopper. Eventually, Harry is able to free Leah of the explosive belt and hurl it inside Clay's helicopter. A final quick time event would have seen Harry grab the detonator as Clay tries to target him. He activates the belt, ending his reign of terror in a burst of flames. In comparison with the Dirty Harry movies, the video game was set to amp up the action to the nth degree. In keeping with this direction, the collective version eventually gained the working title of Dirty Harry Extreme. Much of this, however, was never truly realised. The collective was plagued by what some former developers describe as a creative crisis. The game struggled to break new ground. It was a straightforward cover shooter that was never able to find its unique selling point, something wholly original that would help it stand out. They strive to make playing as Harry feel grounded and realistic, a well-intentioned choice, yet one that restricted them severely with what they could do. As the project entered 2007 and many of the assets for environments and characters were falling into place, the designers had still yet to resolve this. Ex-members of the collective claim that one major issue that caused this was their lead designer apparently dismissing any and all ideas that came from outside the design team. Had they been successful in inventing interesting mechanics on their own terms, this would have been easily forgiven, but it was felt by a growing number of people within the company they had not been. The downfall of the collective's Dirty Harry came towards the start of 2007. By this point, it was fairly far along. A majority of the raw assets were made, and certain levels were well into prototyping, such as the opening mission in which Harry prevents a bank heist. Former developers claim that the order for cancellation came from Malpaso Productions. After checking in on the project, representatives of Clint Eastwood's company weren't satisfied with the way it was progressing, and revoked their access to the rights. Eastwood himself is said to have been determined to see it finished, interested in the possibility of a new Dirty Harry story and the chance to revisit the role. His enthusiasm for the project wasn't enough to save it, however, as his advisors recommended cancelling it to protect the property, and that's exactly what happened. It all went south right before the actor was ever able to record any of his dialogue. In the final months, WBIE's senior vice president Jace Hall and developers from Monolith Productions were drafted in to help manage the project and hopefully change its fortunes. Ultimately, even this attempt to inject a stronger leadership wasn't enough. The failure of Dirty Harry Extreme caused the developer to effectively be dismantled. Their parent company, Foundation 9, laid off around 30 of its staffers before merging what remained with Shiny Entertainment, forming Double Helix Games. At Sensory Suite, meanwhile, their version of the game continued development, but not for much longer. Their Dirty Harry was scheduled to be released around July 2007, less than six months away at this point, and it was evident that this was a deadline they would not be able to meet. This was mostly down to the fact that, from the outset, the company was not ideally equipped to develop for home consoles. Previously, they had only worked with handhelds, and this meant they had to spend a lot of time building tool sets to allow them to proceed with home console development. A designer from the project revealed that no more than 10 to 15 percent of the game was in even a rough playable state, and that it wasn't meeting the quality standards they had set themselves. Former developers are quick to admit that the driving sections, despite being the standout feature of their version, were crudely put together. One source who was a senior staff member on the title believes that had it been released, they likely would have been dropped altogether. In early 2007, a meeting was chaired between Warner Brothers and key members of Sensory Sweep. The two reached an understanding and reluctantly agreed that the developer wasn't quite capable of taking on a project of this scale. With that, WB's management shut it down. The decision was partly due to the fallout from the collective's game, a domino effect of sorts. Without their big HD version, the publisher was much less inclined to continue it in any capacity, although that reason really was just the tip of the iceberg. Focus testing conducted by Warner Brothers revealed a definite lack of appreciation for Sensory Sweep's art style of choice. There was also the matter of just how creatively stagnant the whole project had become. Numerous senior employees had left over the course of development, including a lead designer. Some former workers believe it simply passed hands a few times too many, leaving the game meandering without a solid direction. These factors, mixed with how severely far behind schedule it was, spelled doom for the last remaining form of the Dirty Harry video game. With a budget of around 
around $4.1 million, the loss of the contract hurt Sensory Sweep financially, but it was able to limp on for some time after that. What could have set an exciting precedent for Hollywood actors transitioning into video games instead humbled each studio it touched. Former workers of both Sensory Sweep and The Collective say that the game always had the potential to be something special, but even they admit the wrong companies were chosen for the task. The outcome was years of development rife with problems, leaving us with nothing more than one of the more infamous cases of cancelled video games. If you've enjoyed this video, please don't forget to subscribe. You can find many more unreleased games just like this one over on my channel, including an exclusive look at a guitar hero stroke DJ hero MMO. Or you can stick around here to learn about a cancelled open world Superman game. You can visit Unseen64 at unseen64.net. The site is an archive for cancelled, unreleased and beta games. I hope this video has been of interest and have fun.